swear. <laughs> okay, well, then I'll go to Katoa. Um, this is Carl Burrows here from Hucker Works. I am um, on the, I'll be running this podcast, Hucker in the Matrix. Why Hucker in the Matrix? Again, Hucker is what we do, it's what we love. And also, it's, it's a metaphor for our culture, some of the knowledge that has been passed down to, our, to us from our ancestors. And Matrix, well, we remember Neo and the, and the journey he had to take through the various worlds to get him to understand his purpose in life. Uh, and it's similar to us. We go through, uh, we navigate our, our way through various worlds and to find our own purpose in life as individuals and as communities. And uh, we think we are very lucky as Māori to have some tools that have been passed down to us from our ancestors to, to enable us to, to um, do this. And what I'm really keen to do is share that with other people, but understanding also there are limitations around that um, to make sure that what we do um, protects the integrity of what we've been given uh, from our ancestors. So I've been talking to a, a quite a few people about this, and one of them is um, we've got on today is James Kerr. So there's James there. Kia ora, James. Kia ora. Hi. Uh, so I'm just, as we've done in previous weeks, I'm just going to do a little karakia and a little mihi mihi, and a mihi is just to acknowledge you all, acknowledge the kaupapa or the reason that we're here today, and also to acknowledge ancestors because of, as because of them we are here um, at this point in time. I'm, I'm going to do a karakia, and the karakia is really puts us in the right frame of mind to go forward. And this particular one, Tātai Whakapapa, is about acknowledging heaven and earth, the ancestors, the gods, and uh, humanity, our ancestors who have brought us again to this point in space and time. So, tēnā koutou katoa, wakarongo mai kia mātou, kia māua nei ko James i tēnei wā, uh, ko Hakaworks tēnei e mihi kauana, uh, tēnā koutou. Tēnā anō oki koutou, ko tai mai rungi te kaupapa te wā, me ki ko ngā taonga tukuhiko o ngā tupuna, Nō reira, uh, ka huri ki a rātou, ngā mate o te wā, ngā mate e hinga hinga te kāinga, e tāko toko ki runga ngā marae, haere, haere, haere atu rā. Rātou ki a rātou, tātou ki a tātou, a kia ora mai tātou. Ko rangi ko bāpaka puto ko rongo ko tā, ne mahuta ka tanga roa ko tu matua, ngā haumi e te ki te ki ko tā furi mātou. Toko reta rangi ki runga ka papa ki rāro. Ka puta ko te ratanga te ki te wai au, ki te au mārama, ti hai, mauri ora. Right, kia ora. Kia ora. Just going to um, turn to James right now. Uh, James, I just want to introduce you. I know, uh, well, perhaps people don't know, but over here in the UK uh, and around many parts of the world, James is really well known because of, one, because of his book Legacy, and also he's on the speaking circuit. So he appears um, in front of numerous audiences um, to share his knowledge around leadership. I'm just going to tell a quick story about how I got to know James is because um, his book came out of heaven for me. Um, I got asked to speak about the All Blacks and foolishly said yes um, in a, in, over in uh, Florida for Mont Blanc at the time. And um, luckily for me, James' book just turned up a month before I was um, about to speak. So I was able to get some really good insights on the All Blacks. And what struck me was um, just the insight that uh, James had into Maori culture. Um, and so I became really excited about the content um, that he was sharing and, um, and able to incorporate a lot of that in, in what I spoke about. And since then, I've been uh, working, uh, we've been able to work with James and performing haka around different places around Europe and also teaching haka. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge you, James. Um, kia ora and Hi. welcome. Thank you very much. Great okay. to be here. Hey James, just how about um, we start with you just um, letting us know um, how you got involved with the All Blacks, and this led to your books, the two books, Mana and Later Legacy. Yeah, um, it was about a four-year process of pitching. It, it, it took quite a long time. Uh, I uh, in 1990, some years ago, I did a I did a book. Uh, uh, with a photographer friend and, and colleague, and we went inside the Kangaroos, the Australian rugby team, uh, rugby league team, um, and did a book called 28 Heroes. And I knew nothing about rugby league at the time. And so my dream was always to do it for my team, for the team that I grew up supporting. I'm a, I'm a Kiwi, um, uh, uh, to do something with the All Blacks. Um, and I sort of saw an opportunity, and I, and I presented it to, to New Zealand Rugby, uh, an opportunity to kind of go inside with a photographer, uh, 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 an extraordinary man called Nick Danziger, uh, to do a book called Mana. 
you know, the kind of the, the spirit inside, if you like, uh, the All Blacks photographed in black and white. Uh, it was for a charity, um, for Kids Can, um, which was the official charity of the All Blacks, and that kind of gave us operating permission. And from there, I sort of had the insight and the relationships to to build a, another story, uh, uh, which was Legacy, uh, which in which I really wanted to, I guess, kind of capture what I'd learned through, not just through the experience of spending time with the team, but but my experience of of New Zealand and of New Zealand culture um, and all its sort of various aspects and bring that to the leadership space and the idea of, you know, leading a team, leading a business and in, in some ways leading a life. Uh, and so from that legacy was born um, what the All Blacks can teach us about the business of life, 15 lessons in leadership. So that's the sort of potted history. Good boy. Um, yeah, well, as you said, you're a New Zealander and you live over here in the UK. I suppose just the, the culture of New Zealand, and I mean, for a lot of us humble New Zealanders to see it so prominent over here um, via the vehicle of the All Blacks is quite amazing. And for you to be able to have access to the All Blacks and share that story is, uh, is I mean, it's incredible for us and it's just opened up a world of possibilities um, for yourself and other people such as myself. Uh, I mean, what, can you share some, some of the, the highlights, I suppose, around what you've learned? And particularly what I'm interested in is, is as I said before, there was, there's a lot of uh, references to Maori culture, some direct, some are a bit more subtle. Do you want to share some of those with us? Sure. Um, uh, big question, you know, what have, what have I learned? I think, um, I mean, just a little bit of context, you know, I'm really interested in, in culture, team culture, and I've had the opportunity to work with very, very much the, the All Blacks for a case study of how uh, of, of a great team culture, any team culture works. And so I've also had an opportunity both before and since to work with, you know, premiership football teams, um, uh, special force operators, SWAT, to FBI SWAT teams, Formula One, America's Cup, uh, wow. Even with the cricket team, sadly, yeah. uh, before the last World Cup uh, for New Zealanders, um, and you know, and and all those teams have something in common, or many many things in common. They're all tend to be very values based organisations. They know what they stand for. They know what they don't. They have a clear vision and they have a driving purpose. You know, a reason to be and a contribution they're going to make. Now, I think the All Blacks, you know, are the epitome of that. You know, they're very values based. You mentioned the word humility. Humility is one of their core values in a way, maybe their most important values, you know, kind of never be too big to do the small stuff that needs to get done. Don't get ahead of yourself. Don't think yeah. you're special. You know, you've got a yeah. fo relentless focus on excellence to do the best, the, the small things best, you know, the fundamental is better than anyone else. And to be the best, to win every game and to be, to be the best team in the world and to win every game is their kind of one of the mantras. Um, and 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 a culture of respect you know respect for the for roles and responsibilities and diversity and everybody has their role and kind of doing it right and respect for the jersey and for the ancestry you know the another core idea is to leave the jersey in a better place you know to represent all those who have come before us in our lineage and all those who will come after which is uh the fucker papa you know it's an extraordinarily powerful primal idea. But, but the All Blacks aren't the only team to do this, interestingly. You know, if you look at some special force operations, the SAS, the British SAS here, relentless pursuit, their value set, a relentless pursuit of excellence, personal discipline in every detail, what they call rank but no class, which is a culture of respect, and yeah. humility and a sense of humour. Um, so I think one of the things that's really interesting, I'll come back to the New Zealand um, kind of aspect of it in a moment, but one of the things that's really interesting is that the uh, that these ideas, these core ideas, seem to have lasted for centuries, for millennia. They're ancient ideas, yeah. almost anthropological. Yeah. You know, it's what it's always taken for a for a warrior band, if you like, for a band of brothers to go out there and take on the rest of the world and win. Um, yeah. Now, clearly, the All Blacks have drawn. You know, any culture, any team culture, draws by sort of by osmosis, some sort of social osmosis from. The environment in which it exists the great teams are embedded in their communities they represent their communities of course the all blacks represent new zealand and new zealand is a multicultural country 
uh, with a, with a kind of Maori backbone, if you like, uh, you know, yeah. uh, and and so they represent the you know the Fenua, the land, and they 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 represent uh, the 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 of of a of a nation, if you like, uh, and and everything about that, and 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 respect, um, you know, mana, you know, the, all of those all of those um, currents, I guess, have fed into it, and of course, that's very much embodied with the haka. Um, which is, you know, fundamentally about being connected, of course, and being connected to the breath and being connected to the land, being connected to our ancestors and being connected to that lineage and being connected to each other. Um, so that em literal embodiment of bringing it all together, I think, it, it permeates outwards through that team and, and, of course, very much through New Zealand. And it is an ancient wisdom that is an ancient not just an a new zealand indigenous wisdom I, I believe i think it goes back in a way even further than that you know there's a phrase you know all our ancestors come from waikiki from hawaii you know there is a world that is coming into this a sort of an anthropology of of what connects human beings very powerfully and i think that's a very powerful aspect of all teams but the all blacks in particular yeah um well i Gathered from what you were just saying, really, there's, I mean, there's the there's huge complexity of layers in terms of the yeah. different um, influences that have been born on, on the All Blacks, and um, I suppose what was exciting was just to recognise ourselves in there, um, as New Zealanders, um, yeah. to see ourselves as New Zealanders, and also for the Maori voice to come through um, so strongly in there, um, yeah. and and not in a direct way, you know, um, just in some of the subtle ideas that you were talking about, and I agree. Uh, they are old ideas. They they come from um, tribes. You know, this is how tribes yeah. um, used, used, um, would work together in the past. Um, I just really want to try and pull out, sort of, just for our purposes, I suppose, um, sure, yeah. purposes of our listeners, just some of the um, the ideas that were that stood out for me as being Maori, and which I love to share because um, because. And I and I tell you, the motivation for me is really we've had a history of other people saying our our ideas. Um, aren't of value, um, and for us to read that these ideas are actually valuable not only to ourselves but to people in the business world kind of likes the spark within us, you know. And I just think, um, just from a personal level for our own, um, there's real benefit in knowing that, and also I think there's a real benefit in that being shared with others as well. So this is, um, you know, the, the pleasure I suppose or the spark that I got out of reading uh, Legacy. Yeah. Um. Some of them. Um. You know, uh, are quite obvious. You talk about um, Fano, for example, and Fano in a collective sense, and and a or a, a expanded sense, um, extended. I mean, and also there's, I mean, and that was you know the essence of tribe in the past. You know, you needed a group of people to be able to survive, um, and then there was, um, I mean, the haka, of course, and ideas around haka, but also some of the the the, the less ones which are more universal and easier to explain in a universal context so there, there was humility and putting others before the individual and focus on purpose you know yeah. we have this word kopapa which um is you know if we take all this energy from haka for example and, and put it into kopapa our, our purpose it just helps bind us together I mean, was that um, something that you sort of knew in advance, or it emerged as you discovered, or in the story? Um, I think, or? I think, I, I think a bit of both. I think, I mean, clearly the haka is a is a very public announcement yeah. uh, of some of that. But you know, the history of the haka and performed by Pakeha on the rugby field wasn't necessarily a glorious one. You you know, you you don't have to look back too far to see so it's the travesty of it. You know, it was very almost touristic and and novelty based i think and um you know i think i think what happened in terms of the team discovering it d discovering that connection was probably in the in the buck shelford era um and the haka changed considerably you know at that point there was an embracing of what it really meant there was an embracing an understanding of what it really meant and a and a, a you know and a an intention, a purpose, if you like, of 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 really delivering and making it real. And you know, I, I'll, I'll come back to my journey in a second. But I think one of the interesting things about the re-embracing of the haka is there was a, a a true connection, I think, that extended well beyond the team at that point. That really 
went out into the community in New Zealand and it was kind of a maturing, I believe, of New Zealand mm. and an embracing of that aspect of, of being a New Zealander and uh, uh, and embracing the haka and embracing Maritanga and all of that kind of, you know, was a very pivotal point, I think, if you look back at New Zealand's cultural history. And I think that's one of the, pow the most powerful things. I think um, I think the, the other thing, um, there's a remarkable man involved uh, with the All Blacks uh, called Gilbert Anoka. Um, and Gilbert Anoka is a mental skills coach, uh, in fact, a manager in charge of leadership. I think he's been with the team, I'm not sure how many years. Now, if he's listening, Gilbert, Bert, hi. Um, um, the, and, and, you know, one of his brilliance, uh, aspects of his brilliance is his ability to kind of synthesize a lot of what is going on in the current and bring it into the room. Um, and in 2004, the All Blacks were in some trouble. You know, they'd, they'd, uh, they'd come out of, uh, of a previous coach's era. They had uh, missed, they'd fallen in the semifinals of the World Cup. Um, there was a sort of, I would say, a cultural malaise uh, in some ways. Uh, Graham Henry and, and co had taken over uh, and they needed to reboot this culture. And Gilbert and Wayne Smith and uh, Steve Hansen and, and Graham Henry were very instrumental in going, right, who are we and what do we stand for? And that kind of cultural reboot that involved developing a new haka, but it really involved kind of scraping away what wasn't necessary. My take on it, at least, is it was involved scraping away what wasn't necessarily and bringing the sort of what was the DNA up. And there was a general embracing of, of, of Maori heritage, of Maori concepts, and a kind of a reinvigoration of stuff that I think was sort of latent within the team, but it was made much more explicit. Um, and of course, my journey in was was learning from the masters uh, to an extent, and 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 some uh, some extraordinary conversations where I really started to understand. I I think I hope uh, you know what they were trying to what they were trying to achieve, and 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 that's really about a sense of kind of belonging and responsibility, uh, representing the ancestry of of the All Blacks, uh, which in itself is a very um, uh, Maori idea. The, the the other aspect, a couple of interesting things. You know, humility. You know, people misunderstand humility as a concept, as a word. I think because because being cocky and arrogant sometimes is seen to be strong. Yeah. But of course, the opposite is really true. Co yeah. Being cocky and arrogant often is a is a replacement for insecurity. Um, yeah. To be truly confident, you can be humble. You can be strong, and you are strong enough in yourself. So there's a there's a real understanding of that. But there's also a real understanding that that arrogance is sort of the enemy of high performance. Ego is the enemy of high performance. If you get ahead of yourself, you get into trouble. Hence, the SAS have humility as part of their ethos. The, the U.S. Navy SEALs, who I've had a huge privilege of working with. Um, their trident, their badge of belonging. The American Eagle has its head bowed in humility, because you know you don't. If you get ahead of yourself, as I say, you get shot. Yeah. So there's a reason for it. It's not just well, we'll be shrinking violets and tall poppy syndrome and all of that. It's because there's genuine strength in in staying humble and staying hungry, um, putting the team first. All of that. They're, they're, that's really the trait of a of a winner. And I I, I think that very much comes out of uh, Maori culture. You know, one of the stories I talk about in the book is the is the uh, you, I, I'm not sure what they're called, Cal. You might be able to help, but the the carvings on on um, in, on meeting houses, yeah, you know, are, are not the prettiest things. They're kind of you know gargoyles almost. They're they but they are the greats. They are the um, the ancestors and some great heroes. Now in Greek culture. They would be uh, eight foot tall and carved out of marble and looking incredible, Apollonian, yeah. right? Uh, but in Maori culture, they're, you know, they're seen as slightly weird looking. And I, I'm not quite sure the, the word, but because it's about humility, you don't want to kind of big yourself up too much. But in that, there's real power. There's genuine yeah. power in that. And I think that's something that it, it certainly, you know, I've had an opportunity to kind of, I feel, sort of represent New Zealand, represent, I'm not Maori, but, but represent that cultural aspect 
um, out in the world. And, and there's huge resonance with that because it's clearly a message the world needs to hear. Mm. Um, we, we only have to look at some of the failures of leadership that's going on at the moment and how ego driven uh, a lot of it is. But the real leaders serve. The real leaders serve. They, they, are, they are making a contribution. Their purpose is a contribution uh, to, 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 to the world. And, and individuals or leaders who live with that mindset, live in that mindset of service and contribution, are going to be the successful ones. Okay. Um, it's what the world needs. It's our definition of a hero, really. Somebody who gives their life so that others may prosper. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something that, I mean, I, I, I said before, this is a, a common thing in sort of tribal behavior, but it's something that's particularly profound, I think, within the, within the Maori cultural uh, paradigm, for want of a better word, and sort of spiritual matrix, um, that, that, uh, that it's a privilege to, and an honor to be able to share, and quite extraordinary to see the sort of the relevance and the resonance that it has today. Yeah, well, there's a lot to unpack in there. Um, Sorry, but, yeah, I'm, I'm just <laughs> going all over the place, but hopefully it's of interest. You know. Well, the, just thinking about the, the carvings, the tickle tickle um, you were yep. saying, and um, I think just one way to talk about it is, I don't know if ugly is the word, but... No, it's not the word. I was struggling for the word. You understand? No, that, that was, no it's my word I'm thinking of right now that comes to head. But, you know, when we do haka, it's about being ugly, you know. Yeah. And, and ugly in the sense that, it's a beautiful thing because this is who we really are, you know. Raw, we, yeah, raw and real, exactly. Yeah. And we strip away um, the ego and the, the essence of us is left, you know. And it's the same with these carvings; they're doing the same thing. We we take away the external, and we leave the essence of of our ancestors uh, left in these carvings. And and that's, um, I think this is um, this is how I see it anyway. Um, yeah. Uh, I just think also. Yeah, well, there's a couple of things you see. One was, you know, that it's all, you know, a lot of tribal cultures have that, um, you know, in terms of these ideas. And 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 this is, I think you're right, you know, um, a lot of the ideas come from there, but you also said that Māori have in quite a pro profound way. And I'm just thinking why, and and, and um, I think, you know, we've just got to look back at the symbolism that we use uh, and the way that we connect to the land and the way we connect to our ancestors and, and connect to each other, you know, that, brings it together and makes it really a real living and, thing. And I, and I also think there's a tremendous storytelling tradition. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, that brings it to life, you know, yeah. and the oratory and the, the communication and the collective communication, the, I stand up and speak on, you know, I represent my ancestors, you know, all of that stuff yeah. um, is tremendously powerful um, yeah. uh, and not necessarily the same everywhere. I, you know, I think, there's a writer called Joseph Campbell who talks about the monomyth, you know, that really all our belief systems, all our archetypes um, come from, you know, way, way, way back then uh, and that we're all related somehow way back then, but but somehow deeply imprinted in us. There, there, are, there are the same stories and whether we kind of grew up Catholic in Poland or, or you know, Maori in New Zealand or somewhere else, that the, that the core kernel of the stories are all the same. Mm. But... It's always in the telling. Yeah. You know, the telling is the way that, that you, you know what I mean? It's, yeah, yeah. it's um, West Side Story is, is Romeo and Juliet told differently. Yeah. Um, and so it's in the telling. And I think that tremendously eloquent um, uh, narration of, 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 of a belief system is something that, that, that you know, Maori bring to the table if you like um yeah. and and you know n n nowhere more so than in the haka which is a kind of a an embodiment of everything and a, an extraordinarily theatrical telling yeah uh, of mm. a symbolic story mm. Mm. yeah okay i, I want to come back to storytelling as well but before we do i just you know what is it about i'm just trying to think you know we've got all these ideas um from a maori culture um and expressed through the all blacks well Maybe that's the answer, but what is the appeal um, to about around these ideas to well, modern businesses? Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, because the yeah. we 
you know, the, the, the narrative that we hear all the time is around individualism and competition. And because of that, that, um, you know, encourages us to innovate and move forward. But these ideas are, you know, down the other end of the spectrum. They're about working together as a team. Not it's not about the individual. It's 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 putting everyone, um, in front of, um, well, putting the team before the individual. So yeah, what are your thoughts? Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, I think I think I think there's a lot of sort of mythology around the idea of individualism and that it's all about me. You know yeah. that individualistic thing. Now that isn't really the language of winners, particularly. No. If, if anyone's been watching the Michael Jordan documentary on Netflix, um, The Last Dance, um, uh, you, you know we're, lo we're looking at an athlete, a supreme individualistic athlete, um, who set very, very high standards. An extraordinary athlete, Michael Jordan, one of the greats in any field of all time. Now. Um, there's there's a there's a famous story that Phil Jackson, his coach, um, I'll come back to business in a moment, but his coach um, uh, said, listen, you've got two MVP rings to, to Jordan, but you don't have a championship ring. If you can change the me for the we, you can have as many championship rings as you want. And Jordan left with six. Okay. You know, Phil Jackson has 11. You know, uh, or thirteen, maybe now. I'm not sure. Um, but, but um, you know, the point being is that you know, no man or woman is an island. We all do work in teams. We all contribute to something. That there are very, very few realms in life where we do it on our own. Yeah. Um, and actually, contributing to something greater than ourselves is a is a much more surefire way to individual success than grabbing than some land grab for self um yeah. and and um and actually it kind of figures we talked about purpose before but but you know purpose is really about a contribution it's about the impact that we make you know what we're going to bring about in the world and if you play big you tend to get bigger rewards what we give we get you know anyone who's been in a in a relationship knows that if you're the taker in a relationship that relationship's not necessarily going to be a good one and it's yeah. You know, it's really true of, true of everything. So that idea of sort of we live in selfish times and, and selfish people win, I, I think is mythological in a sense and yeah. very short-termist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Jim Collins in, in Good to Great, I think it was, wrote about the level five leader. You know, he did a, a, a longitudinal study and, and looked at, you know, the, those that had the most value over a longer period, a long period of time. Uh, to their companies and they're all level five leaders who are trying to contribute to something beyond themselves bigger than themselves yeah they're yeah. not there for the short term yeah. so so i think that idea of you know it's it's not just how as a particular sports team or a particular culture work it's really how human beings work and uh, that yeah. comes back to the anthrop anthropological thing you know we are sort of hardwired to survive as a group yeah. Um, and our understanding of that relationship to group becomes really important. Netflix has a um, has a, uh, a a kind of a culture piece they call freedom and responsibility, and it's really perfectly poised that balance between well we have individual freedom and we need that autonomy and we need all of that, but it's always yoked somehow to responsibility, to the our duty to a broader base and and negotiating that in politics and society within a team within a business is one of those key kind of seesaws that, that we need to understand uh, and work with and I think the clues for you know you know that the, one of the reasons that I wanted to focus on the All Blacks is they're the most successful sporting team team in any thing of all time ever yeah so they're not doing anything wrong yeah and, and any organization, and it's the, the principle scale up, any organization that, that doesn't think that they can learn from that, and any individual that doesn't think they can learn from that, because you, you go, the All Blacks may be team first, but, you know, Dan Carter still sits, still, I think, still sits as the highest point scorer ever in international rugby. Mm. Mm. Yeah. You know, Richie McCaw still won international player of the year, what, four or five times. You know, you know, they are still legends and superstars and they are extraordinary in their own right. Yeah. But they're also part of a team. That, but they wouldn't be that if they hadn't been part of a team that won a couple of World Cups. You yeah, know, sure. so freedom and responsibility, I think, is mm. fundamental. 
Yeah, I think too, society's changed over, you know, if, when you think back to the industrial era and, um, you know, we had these huge factories and, and the way that um, leaders communicated was, you know, telling people what to do uh, and people just did it, you know, because they needed to work on a factory line and just, and the whole thing worked as a result of people being told what to do and do it as they were told. Yeah. But I think now um, organizations are a lot flatter, um, they're smaller, and, they, they, and you talk about this too in your, in your in legacy, um, they need to adapt um, yeah. a lot more quickly. And um, I remember the story that you tell about, um, I think it, was the, it wasn't the SAS, is about the US military and, and having to um, get information from point from the leadership to the, the front yeah. line really quickly and allowing them to make decisions. Um, I think yeah. it's more reminiscent of a, um, of, of, of a smaller tribal culture. Or, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, Stan McChrystal, who ran the US military um, for, for a period, um, uh, he, he, he's written a book and he talks about teams of teams. Yeah. You know, that organizations now are best aligned as teams of teams. Um, because we work much better in, in, in uh, there's a sociologist called Dunbar and he talks about Dunbar numbers, you know, um, that, that we really work as teams really well in that sort of platoon size, around 15, rugby team, 15 to 30. Yeah. Most departments tend to break down into that kind of thing. Most kind of line managers are, uh, uh, are operating on that kind of level. And so, um, so that small team dynamic uh, is ex extraordinarily important and you need the big picture. Uh, so I think what you're referring to in, in legacy is, is really talking about mission command yeah. and the mission command uh, uh, doctrine, which is the, the leadership doctrine in most militaries around the world now. Yeah. And it's around creating autonomy uh, and therefore the ability for small teams to take the initiative, to be able to respond and react to changing circumstances. And, you know, God knows right now that's what's needed the most. You know, yeah. there is no grand plan anymore right now. You know, how are we going to respond? And actually responding to the, you know, if you take a rugby analogy, playing the ball as it falls, you know, you know, reading the game in front of you, that's much better done with, you know, 15 human beings going, geez, guys, what are we going to do now? than some monolithic corporate going, this is our grand strategic plan. Grand strategic, there is no grand strategy uh, right at the moment. And, mm -hmm. and, and that grand strategy anyway, it might set a big picture. We're going generally in this direction, but each department, each team needs to figure out how to kind of make their way in that area. And so the dynamics of a small team are even more important, I think, than they have ever been yeah. uh, in, in allowing that. And, and mission command is about, uh, providing alternative uh, um, um, autonomy and initiative at, at, a, at a sort of subordinate level. So, so the leadership sets the, 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 the vision, what's called the commander's intent. And then, the, then the, the idea is they select people right, they get the right people on board, they train them right, so they have the capability to do the, the work. They resource them right, so they have the capacity to do the work. And then they give them an order in a particular way, which is called in order to the commander's intent. I want you to do this in order to achieve such and such. And then they get out of the way. Well, yeah. they should get out of the way. Um, and what that does is it creates its leaders from the ground up. It's how leaders create leaders. Um, and it's how those teams bring out, it's how you bring out the best in those teams to go and make decisions for themselves on the fly. Yeah. Uh, knowing there's a big end game, knowing where they're going, but but figuring out the how, um, and that's a small team dynamic. It's very much uh, if you look at the way the All Blacks created what's called sort of a distrib distributed leadership model. Yeah, you know, I phrased it one captain but fifteen leaders. Um, that's really what you want, and that's that's a, a, a band, a small warrior band approach um, to to achieving things, and so. You know, we can go back in prehistory of guerrilla warfare and the bush in New Zealand and think, well, it's mm. not far off what was going on there. Yeah. I think the other thing too, James, is that, um, you know, I mean, you talked about Joseph Campbell, but the, you know, the journey of the hero was pretty much an individualistic journey, but for, you know, community purposes, you know, there was benefit yeah. for the community at the end of it. 
But I think yeah. we, we've always been good at describing the journey of the individual. We haven't been so good about describing how we work together in the interrelationships. And I think um, you know, there's a lot of, in the last 40 years, there's a lot of psychology that's come out with, and research, which has enabled us to, I suppose, appreciate, um, even though there's this narrative of individualism, actually, um, it, is, it never has been just about the individual, it is about um, the teams, uh, about people. Um, I just want to come back to storytelling uh, and just, you know, I think back to where um, I come from and, you know, with the, in terms of culture, there are, like you say, Maori culture, there are a lot of people who are very um, persuasive. They're good storytellers. And I'm thinking of my little marae in the back of Taranaki and, you know, our kaumata would stand up and tell stories of, of, about the place. And um, they were just really moving, you know. They just... Mm -hmm me on a really emotional level and I'd, I've got those visions still in my mind of them speaking. Um, and my mother used to just sit at the table and tell us about her childhood as growing up Māori and um, I'd find myself mesmerised, you know, and as an adult I'm sort of questioning those stories now, that, could they really be true? But at, the time, <laughs> at the time I was just, um, I was just caught in, a, in, a, in, a, in an, an emotion which took me on a journey which sort of kept me spellbound through that journey. And um, just, again, linking that to um, business, and it was Steve Jobs that said, um, you know, the storyteller is the greatest, going to be the most powerful person in the world. And and I'm just trying to think, I'm just trying to understand what is the appeal to business people around people who are like yourself, who are able to tell stories? Um, you know, I think stories connect people on an emotional level, as you say. Yeah. Um, that, that it is a way to create common cause. Yeah. Um, you know, what are we doing and why are we doing it are two of the greatest questions facing us in life, existentially in life. You know, who are we? Where are we going? Why does it matter? What's the meaning behind this? You know, what is the meaning of life without being too um, too dramatic about it? And, and anyone who can set that agenda, who can create context, who can give meaning to other human beings uh, is powerful mm. uh, in a sense. You know, you know, people talk about the the arts are facing a major crisis with COVID at the moment. But what do we do in lockdown? We we look at stories. We go on Netflix. We read books. We read the papers, hoping somebody will make sense of this mess for yeah. us. Yeah. You know, we 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 we're hungry more than anything for stories, and 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 stories uh, give give a lot of meaning. And so, so the great storytellers. Um, you know, you create the conditions in which we live in, and you know, and you know, if we if we look at COVID, for instance, the story, the story that came out is we all have to lock down. Now, you know, it could be proven at a later date that wasn't the right story to follow. Mm. That actually there were other strategies that could have played. You know, vulnerable people stay away, and everyone else creates herd um, immunity. We don't know what the right story is at the moment, but the story that took hold was the story of lockdown. And so these stories define what happens. Mm. You know, we kind of live in a fictional universe in a sense. And so, so the power of those stories and the power of being able to tell these stories is incredibly important. And I, I think the other thing you said there that I thought was interesting is you don't even know if those stories were true. <laughs> and, you know, there is another uh, slightly scary, but some is that stories don't need to be true to be real. Mm. You know, um, or they or they don't need to be real to be true. I, I, either or, really. In in that, you know, there's a lot of false. There are a lot of false narratives out there, particularly with the internet. You know, there's a a range of inaccurate, you know, ill-informed memes going out there with of, of all sides of the political persuasion. You know, we have a we we um, we have a president of the United States who perhaps is creating an alternative narrative, not necessarily in a post-truth world. So the story and the truth of the story is a really really important thing to understand, I think. Mm. But you know, coming back to which I, I think was your first, you know, the, the the point of the question is as as leaders, how can we be storytellers? Um, you know, I think. I think by studying some of the great storytellers first, and we talked about the the the, um, the hero's journey, 
you know, which is, you know, an ordinary person called to an extraordinary task, has to overcome um, challenges both internally and externally, um, take guidance from wise people to overcome their great battle and bring home the boon to those they love and love them. And and I think you go, well, in a post-COVID world or in a COVID world, you know, what is that hero's journey? What are we trying to do as businesses, as organizations, as teams? And and I think more and more we're going to be looking for people who can give us that that particular hero journey for us and for our teams. Mm. Um, and stories, of course, can be told through words. They can be told through pictures. They can be told through ritual. Um, and they're told most of all through repetition. You know, okay. finding new ways of saying the same story over and over again, and and it kind of repeating and repeating and 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 thereby standing for something. Being a story, being the still point in a changing world. I think uh, it becomes a really interesting way to look at it. Uh, yeah, a couple of things. So I just, yeah. I really like this idea of, um, you know, the world and how we perceive it as, as something that we make up, you know, in our, in our minds, you know, it's a hallucination. And this is why I like this idea of Hucker in the Matrix, because, um, you know, yeah. we gather all this information from the world and we, we create something that makes some sort of sense to us. Um, and I suppose a storyteller is somebody that helps you create sense of a world, um, something you can anchor yourself to and make yourself uh, feel safe in the moment. But I, but I also think, you know, there's when people become CEOs or, or leaders of organizations, I suppose they don't go into their role thinking that they're going to be leaders. Uh, sorry, storytellers. Um, yeah. you know, they've got all this other stuff going on in their minds, but um, this it's a big yeah it's a big step I think you know psychologically to say um, this is actually my role is to tell stories to help bind people together and within this organization yeah. yeah and and it's not necessarily a skill that everybody has practiced yeah or necessarily you know a lot of the time we get brought up in an organization from our kind of capability at a particular more technical task yeah and then suddenly we're there and actually you know true leadership isn't necessarily a technical task it's a it's a judgment task mm. you know you, uh, the information should be coming and it's up to us to distill that and to make judgments on that and to have and to initiate ideas uh, but really to create that kind of common cause that that uh, sense of direction that sense of meaning uh, and and do all of that and that's not necessarily you know you know, a good good selection would hope that you have good communicators in top posts, but of, often that doesn't happen. But it is a skill that can be learned, um, and uh, and there are some you know key aspects around it, uh, around uh, authenticity and values and representing uh, the the body politic, if you like, capturing mm -hmm. the spirit. Of your organization you know people listen to people who speak for them not at them or to them but that speak for them we are going to achieve this you know this is what we're doing not i have a vision you know um and and uh so partly it comes down to values and really understanding what values are and you know again we talk about in this COVID time we're in a time of re-evaluation uh, what really matters for us, and clearly, our families matter, our loved ones, our time. That we do something here, you know. There's a huge realization: life is fleeting, and we are mortal. Mm. All of that stuff, the stuff comes up that that it's we're moving into a, a new way of doing things. Some of the old certainties don't even matter anymore. Um, so, given it's a time of reevaluation, I think it it it. It, it kind of serves leaders to go back to core values, the core, their own core values, what brought them into the leadership position in the first place, and the organization's core values. What does the organization stand for? Because it's very easy to make some knee-jerk responses and try to kind of make it up as we go along and rush to where the money seems to be. But if we abandon our core values as organizations over that time, uh, then it's going to be short-term gain for a lot of long-term pain. And so really leaders who can understand the values and articulate the values and tell stories based on core common values um, that, that, that will resonate most deeply and be most effective 
um, and kind of reassuring and aligning their organization behind them. Um, yeah, I really like what you said about speaking, um, not speaking to, not speaking at, um, but speaking for people, you know, and, and that's, I think that's a big mind shift, but I mean, how do you do that yourself? Because you don't work in an organization, um, you're not, you don't lead an organization, um, but you come and, how do you come and speak for, uh, with uh, those people? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have led organizations, um, uh, I'm, a bit more of a lone wolf now, just because the my my model um, uh, kind of suits it. I'm a I'm a writer and a speaker. That's my, my chosen direction. But I do have a team around me, a virtual team around me, if yeah. you like. Um, no, I and, mean when you go to speak at conferences and you you know. Well, well I, I think I, I what I try to do is I try to. Um, you know, the, the, the personal, the, the, I, I can't remember who, who said it, but there is a quote that the personal is the universal. Mm. You know, what matters for me will probably matter for others. Yeah. You know, as a, as, a, as a writer, I'm going, you know, they say write what you know, and, uh, but I, I'm not so sure about that. I, I kind of think I, I write what I want to know. I try to explore the things that I want to understand, and I right. figure that if I want to understand them, there might be other people who want to understand yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so I try to make my personal interests interesting, I mm. guess, of interest. And and I think there's some some fundamental beyond business, if you like. I, I never go into a talk thinking I'm speaking to a group of business people. I think I go and, and speak to a group of people. Yeah. Because we're all wrestling with a whole lot more stuff than how to get meet the, the new numbers. Mm. You know, that's that's just part of our lives. We're much more interested in how to be good parents. Yeah. You know, good friends, you know, good people, how to how to how to unleash our own, express our lives, tell our stories. And and I think that if I can address that in people, um, then I'm being useful. My my grandmother had a had a who who would have turned hundred and one today. Uh, uh, she had a she had a great um, uh, saying, I think it was a saying. I've sort of taken it and made it a saying of hers, um, uh, which was just be useful. And uh, and I've always really liked that. If I can walk into a room and just be useful for people, if I can write a book and that book is useful for people, if I can be a leader and be useful for people, then all of that level of contribution and purpose and impact will follow from that. Mm. Um, so that's all I sort of try to do. If I'm sitting there trying to sell books or change minds or, you know, words fall flat, if I'm just sitting there going, hey, this is what I've learned about life and I want to share it, yeah, um, then it tends to have a bit more impact. Yeah. I mean. Hey, just going back to um, you talking about authenticity in, in terms of sharing a story, uh, I want to come on to Haka and, and what, I remember something you said to us at one point is that, you know, when we do Haka, um, it changes the feeling in the room, and um, mm -hmm. I just really want to explore that a bit. What what did you mean by that? Well, well, you know, you talked about you know the ugly, the rawness, the authenticity. I mean, that cuts through a lot of um, you know a lot of stuff. <laughs> you know, if, yeah. if you go to you know, we've been to I think we did one in Cannes, didn't we? Yeah. To, together, yeah. big yeah. crowd in Cannes. You know, so we're at the. I think it's the Palais and Cannes and there's the red carpet and everybody's there, you know, kind of in their business armor, <laughs> you know, and and I think I'm, I'm introduced and then the conch shell goes and you walk in and you blow them away with this performance. Mm. Now, no one's in their business suit anymore after that. <laughs> yeah. You've blown the business suit away. We're down to the raw essence of what it is to be a human being. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. And I think that's massive, you know, you know, in terms of the power of the haka and the power mm -hmm. of kind of direct address. It's honest and it cuts through stuff and it gets there and it connects people on a fundamentally human level, goosebump yeah. human level. And I think that's the, that's the power uh, of the haka and the power of good storytelling of any sort, but the power of the haka, definitely. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, uh, when we... I mean, we've been doing it for a long time now, and, and we, we get all sorts of different responses and reactions. Um, but some people, you know, they don't they they don't know how to deal with their feelings. Uh, they, no. We open this up for them, and they just 
sort of lose a bit of control and some of them start to giggle or you know some or um we're just opening things that are quite deep in them that which they've managed to cover up um yep. for themselves and hide so um and i also think it creates anticipation and um openness really to uh, receive yeah. new messages as, as a as a result yeah i mean you know you know growth personal growth demands some discomfort yeah. you know and, and as you say a little bit of giggling or not quite knowing how to do it is a defensive uh mechanism really but it it i think it shows that you're getting there i you know i have a similar thing i i work with teams who say a football team and they're not necessarily used to standing up and speaking in front of each other so of course that's what i get them to do yeah um okay. because going into zones of discomfort it's like going to the gym you've got to break down your muscles but you've got to hurt before before you before you grow and and to an extent putting people in a situation where they are off their turf and a little bit uncomfortable and connected to people in a raw way they're not able to hide behind the suit or the makeup or the hairstyle or the sunglasses or whatever um of course people are you know it's slightly terrifying yeah but once they've done it and i've seen this in your sessions you know once they've done it they they'll kick down doors you know <laughs> they, they make changes in mm. their life people make changes in their life because they they've changed um and i think that's very powerful yeah no, and just going through the learning process, I mean, some people are obviously terrified that with the fact that they um, may be doing a hucker in the next 10 minutes. Uh, but, I mean, it's just a matter of being generous and, um, you know, staying on track, staying focused in terms of where, yeah. where you're sitting in yourself as a speaker. Um, but just giving people the confidence to try these things and eventually, you know, they'll get through it and you know they're unleashing themselves and it's just it's a real pleasure to um be a part of that to help people through that so when yeah. we do hucker i think essentially it's about you know asking them to take away their ego um connect with their inner spirit so when we say hucker it means ha is, is the breath or the spirit um and cars to ignite so we you know seeking to ignite that um energy comes from that which we share with others and then if we've got a purpose, uh, you know, we channel that energy in our minds at least um, towards that purpose and it gives it shape and that energy has shape. Without purpose, it just becomes scattered and it's almost yeah. about showing off, you know, when you're saying yeah. it's about me. Um, and, yeah, I'm just – any any thoughts? I mean, I'm about, you know, that process and how it may – how people work together as a more cohesive team. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, what you're describing is kind of common cause, you know. Um, the, you, uh, Oliver Cromwell's got a great line, or had a great line, where he said, my, you know, my, my men knew what they fought for and they loved what they knew. And and that sense of being clear, like having a, a the purpose, if you like, yeah. um, and being connected to it igniting the spirit around it which is love in many ways mm, yeah um, is is huge you know that's where teams take off yeah. you know there's a lot of stuff talk talk technical stuff talked about teams and performance and da, da, da. but you know a large part of performance is about love is about energy is mm. about a, a mm. directed energy mm. um and and bringing people together on that journey is something that certainly Haka can do, storytelling can do, um, adversity can do because it brings people together to overcome adversity. Um, all of these different aspects galvanize teams, bring people together. And, you know, I think one of the things that that, um, that that's similar in the work that, that, that you and I do is that, is that, you know, we get the, the privilege of going inside and trying to work at points that kind of ignite that spirit, that common cause, the esprit de corps. Um, and, um, you know, on the, in the principles of war, the first principle is, of war is the selection and maintenance of the aim. It's about purpose. And the second one really, it's in, in no particular order, but the second one really one is about, you know, maintain the morale, esprit mm. de corps, get everyone moving in the same direction. Mm. And I think what you've described from the Haka, that idea of, um a spearhead moving in the same direction um around common cause and connection and ignited spirits and passion and and purpose you know it's kind of fulfilling something very fundamental 
in what makes great teams work. So, um, you know, that would probably be my addition to it. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and also just about, you know, the indrawn breath, that sense of connection being, being um, a very, very fundamental human connection. I mean, it's one of the challenges I think leaders are facing now is that everybody's like we are on computer screens in their own homes. Yeah. Um, how do you create common cause? How do you create a sense of connection now? from from uh, a disparate world in which social distancing has become the norm. Social distancing is the opposite of connection. Connection and cohesion is the core of a great team. Um, storytelling and finding opportunities to bring people together in one way or the other is, is more important than it's ever been, I think. Thanks, James. Hey, we've just got a couple of minutes left and I just wanted to give you an opportunity to just say, um, you know, what you what's in the pipeline. Yep. Oh, well, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, uh, I'm writing a book. I've got two books. Uh, you know, the good thing about lockdown is it's given me a bit more time to write. Um, I'm uh, well into a book I'm writing about uh, Everest and Nepal, Nepal, um, and a team of Gurkhas and Sherpas uh, on the mountain in 2015 when the Nepal earthquake hit. Uh, base camp was kind of wiped out. Uh, men uh, and women trapped on the mountain. Uh, and really what happened to a country at that point and how um, how Nepal had to overcome uh, and this particular, seen through the prism of this particular team, had to overcome adversity to kind of get back on its feet and get to the top. Um, it's called Where the Earth Meets the Sky. Uh, the aim is to have it out for the Everest climbing season uh, in April next year, with luck. Um, and so I'm, I'm working on that now. And there are a lot of the same sort of ideas that we've been talking about or, or kind of looking at um, how kind of ancient wisdom influences modern behaviors. Um, but it's a narrative nonfiction book. Um, I'm also uh, then I'm going into a follow up to legacy called the legacy workbook, uh, which is if, if legacy is the what and the why seen through the prism of the All Blacks, the workbook is the how. And it'll be seen through the prism of a whole lot of other teams and organizations um, to, to kind of give more, more um, a kind of a more uh, structured approach. It's called, a, it's subtitled as a curriculum for change. So a more structured approach to, yeah. to, to shifting organizations. Um, and I'm also working with a, with a number of um, uh, high performing teams at various stages of their kind of cultural journey. Um, uh, which slightly on pause at the moment, but is starting to come back online. So, so I still work with with elite teams uh, on on kind of cultural practice and behaviours. Okay. Well, hey James, I just want to say thanks for your contribution today. It's a real um, honour for us to have you on on Hucker and the Matrix. Uh, also, just love the way you um, share such, I suppose, deep ideas. Even just you know using the word love in such a way which is um, you know okay. I just think it's there's something about that, you know, and it's the way you tell your story. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't want to sound like an old hippie, but but you know, I think if there's one one time one thing that this period has taught us um, is that is that we're very much driven by love and care mm. at our best. We're not always, but but at our best, um, and we perform better as teams and as families and as a community when we when when we we bring genuine raw human connection uh to each other and we do stuff for the right reasons um i i think you know there's a myth that the the the, the cynical kind of win i i don't believe that i think i think the the good guys win uh in the end mm. more often than not in life and so I'd, I'd like to sort of bring that but but thank you it's it's been an honor to be part of this and and uh you know uh, to speak to everyone who whoever's uh, watching and listening. So, th so thank you, Carl, and um, stay safe. <laughs> you too, James. Kia ora, everyone. Cheers. Thanks for listening. Matiwa.